morning, church. This is the Lord's day. And we are gathered in worship. And for those who are present in the sanctuary this morning, this is our first time to be together since early March of this year. And I would like to thank you for being here and thank you for following the strict guidelines. And you may know that we are an old church and we used to have the deacons use tithing rods. Tithing rods were used in case someone fell asleep in church. A woman would be tickled under the nose and a man would be wrapped on the back of the head. But today, the ushers will use this if you break any guidelines. So I want you to know that we're ready and armed to help you follow all of the protocols for safety and a safe return. I would like to welcome again our second preacher, Dr. Tyler Linegar. His family is with us, and we're glad that you're here as a liturgist. And he preaches uh, at the church with us once a month, and we're just so grateful for that. And I would like to thank again those who brought the uh, food for the food drive last Saturday. And the needs are great in our community. And we want to testify to God's love in greater Newburyport and beyond. And so I encourage you, if you come to church, bring food with you. We will collect it there in the area right close to the School Street entrance. And if you are desiring to write a check to the deacons for the deacons fund, that goes toward paying for food and for necessary items that are at the food bank at First Parish Church. Today, we are regretting that we do not have the sound and camera system that we are so grateful for. We have run into a lot of technological problems, and so if you find that the live stream is not to your satisfaction, bear with us. The message is important, and it doesn't surprise me that it would be disturbed in some way. So let us prepare for what it is that God has for us, the living Lord is with us in the Spirit. Let us be called to worship. Join me in the call to worship. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Let us consider him who endured such opposition from sinful people, so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. We come to the Lord, who is rich in grace, we will praise God with all our heart and believe the good news.
confess our sins together before our merciful God. Almighty God, because of Christ's blood, do not hold against us, poor sinners that we are, any of the sins we do or the evil that constantly clings to us. Forgive us, just as we are fully determined to forgive our neighbors. By ourselves, we are too weak to hold our own, even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those who love me I will deliver, says the Lord. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them and show them my salvation. Receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let's share the peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be always with you. Hear God's word from Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Let's sing to God together. <laughs>
We are in the last book of the Bible. The revelation of Jesus Christ to John the Apostle given to the church. Revelation means to unveil like this curtain, to pull back so that you can see what was hidden. Last week we looked at Revelation 4 and 5 and found that what is hidden is that God is on the throne in full control. And the Lamb, which looks like He is slain, Jesus Christ is standing among God's people. And the Lamb is given a scroll and on it is written the whole meaning of life, the whole meaning of history. And now, Revelation 6 and 7, the Lamb, Christ, begins to open the scroll, breaking the seven seals with which it's sealed. Revelation 6 and following are where most churches stop. They don't go this far. So you are venturing into territory that few go into. And it begs the question of why is there evil when Christ is enthroned? It's Annie Dillard, the author, who voices the chief theological question we all want to ask. What in the sand hill is going on here anyway? So that brings us to Revelation 6. Verses 1 through 8, with portions followed. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out, conquering and to conquer. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he was given a great sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for one day's pay, three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he, the lamb, opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, come. I looked and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence and by the wild animals of the earth. Picking up in chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on earth or sea or against any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. He called out with a loud voice to the four angels, who had been given power to damage earth and sea, saying, Do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have marked the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe, of the people of Israel. Going over to verse 11. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four... Verse 9. After this, I looked. There was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the angels and the four living creatures, they fell on their faces before the
the throne and worshiped God. Let us pray. Living God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, one in three, three in one. We pray that you would now seal us with your Holy Spirit, that we may receive a word from you that lasts our whole life long into eternity. We ask this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. I was delighted this week to spend some time with Ed and Carrie Cromley, who are seated here. Wave your hand. They are graduates of a school where they learned how to make film documentaries. A documentary film takes a viewer behind the scenes and gives a revelation of what would otherwise be unknown. What becomes known has the power to change the present and affect the future. Let me give you an example. Seven years ago, the documentary film Blackfish came out. It told the story of Tilica, an orca sea whale which had been in various sea world theme parks throughout this country. And Tilica was involved in the deaths of three people. What the film showed was the devastating effects that captivity has on the orca whale which are highly intelligent, sensitive creatures. They suffer deep and lasting grief when they're separated from their family. They experience anger and depression when they lose the wide open ocean and are put instead in shallow pools. The film is heartbreaking. And people's eyes were open through that documentary and government stepped in and banned the use of entertainment-driven whale captivity. SeaWorld announced that it was phasing out all live performances of orchids. What was known through the documentary led to change. And that's what Revelation 6 and 7 does for us, because it answers three questions. What happens on the earth as the Lamb is reigning right now in heaven? Second, what does evil do? And three, who can stand in evil times? So what happens on earth as the Lamb is on the throne? I want to ask you what you believe. Because what you believe is going to affect your quality of the Christian life. Are you disappointed? Are you disillusioned as a Christian, wondering why your faith doesn't work any better than it does? Let's look at chapter 6, those first eight verses. Four times, Jesus the Lamb opens a seal, and four times we hear a creature, one of the four creatures calling out, Come! as a prayer. Four times, a horse and a rider go out into the world, each horse being a different color. That does remind me of watching The Wizard of Oz in the red and yellow and purple, brightly colored horses that they filmed. I learned that when they made The Wizard of Oz, the uh, ASPCA, did not allow them to use dye on the white horses. So the technicians tented the horses with cherry, lemon, and grape jello powder. They had trouble in between the takes keeping the horses from licking off the colored jello. Think about that when you see that next time. So what is happening that happens four times as a sequence? The land opens a seal, and someone prays, come. It's a, it's a prayer for the lamb to fully and finally come. And what happens in 
response? Bad things happen. Represented by four horses and riders. Now, Jesus coming does not cause terror and misery. But as Jesus answers the prayer, it is coming. Opposition arises. That results in misery and terror. Because God's kingdom upsets the status quo. The coming of Christ will flush out evil, and evil always responds with resistance. I have to ask you, you've probably seen this in your own lives. How do you know when someone wants to hold on to some dark, destructive practice? You know it by how angry and defensive they become when they are presented the truth. Evil resists Christ's coming. And it's been that way from the beginning. The King of Heaven entered into human life, the birth in Bethlehem. Immediately, King Herod tried to have him murdered. Jesus pronounced the kingdom of God and showed it in his words and his deeds that truly the kingdom had come near. And the religious authorities, the government authorities, had him killed. God's kingdom power was demonstrated in the raising of Jesus in the resurrection, turning the disciples into bold ambassadors of the kingdom. The religious and the government leaders killed and persecuted the followers of the Lamb in the first three centuries. Anytime the kingdom of God comes into a person's life, into a church congregation, it will clash with those who are in rebellion. Perhaps you've experienced this in your own family or your work environment. You know the phrase, NIMBY, not in my backyard. That's what evil does when Christ is coming in, not in my backyard. Not unless you want the fight of your life. So followers of the Lamb get caught in this crutch. Those who go through it go through an ordeal. We didn't read the rest of chapter 7 of Revelation. But you see that those who are around the throne are, are told that they have gone through the great ordeal. Ordeal is the word for persecution. We've studied it before. It's that word lipsis in Greek, which means crushing pressure. They go through the mega lipsis, the mega pressure. It's going to squeeze the very life out of them. They have come through that. So we find that you and I have tasted it, and we will have more. Scripture also shows us that evil is not on the throne. It's on a leash. We, we saw that as we looked at chapter 6, that the, the horse and the rider that came out that was white was given a crown. Verse 4, the rider was permitted to create violence. We heard that they were given authority. Evil can do no more than God allows. It's always on a leash. Jesus told his disciples, John 14, 30, the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. Evil is not from God. God's way is the Lamb's way. Sacrificial love. Suffering love. Evil results when people resist Christ's coming. And God permits them to do what they want. This is what we see in chapter 6. God takes his hands off. 
giving people permission to respond by saying, no, not in my backyard. And evil results. When our son was 10, he insisted that I allow him to work in the kitchen alone, making his own donuts. I did not think he was ready for this enterprise, but he assured me and got me out of the kitchen. With a 10-year-old, you respect that they're trying their wings. What resulted? Well, boiling oil, a ball of fire, a singed ceiling, and burned hair. God permits rebellion, but only so far, and only for a limited period of time. Evil is on a leash, not the throne. Brings us to our second question. What does evil do? We're going to look at those four horsemen and the other things that follow. The first that we see is that when the seal is broken, a white horse whose rider has a bow, a crown which represents authority, is given to him. He comes out to conquer and to conquer it. Conquer is the Greek word Nike. Now, you won't know exactly how that was used by the athletic company, Nike, conquer, victory. It's used later in Revelation for personified evil. The beast comes to conquer. The bow is a biblical symbol for military power. So the rider represents militarism, riding in conquest. Does this rider on a white horse represent Christ? Biblical commentaries Robert Mounts and Daryl Johnson think not. The rider wants to imitate Christ. Conquer by deception. We've heard before 2 Corinthians 4, 11, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Jesus tells us that many people will come saying, I am the Messiah, and try to lead even God's own people away. Evil tries to conquer by deception. You remember Lance Armstrong? In 2001, Lance Armstrong, who won seven of the Tour de France races, he made an anti-doping commercial for Nike. In the commercial, Armstrong boldly states, this is my body. I can push it, study it, tweak it, listen to it. Everybody wants to know what I'm on. What am I on? I'm on my bike. Six hours a day. What are you on? 2006, Armstrong took sworn testimony that he had never taken drugs because he had too much to lose. He represented all those who put faith in him as cancer survivors all around the world. In October of 2012, Armstrong was stripped of his seven titles, his seven victories, permanently banned from professional cycling. The U.S. Anti-Doping Commission found him guilty. He attempted to conquer by deception. Where do you see deception at work in the world today? It is evil. But deception is not the only manifestation. Let's go through this quickly. The first seal is broken. And we hear the prayer, come, and the white horse goes out. And those who refuse the way of the Lamb will fall into deception and greater and greater militarization. The second seal, red horse. If the world refuses the way of the Lamb, there will be greater and greater violence. People will turn against one another. Third seal, the black horse. If the world refuses the Lamb, there will be greater and greater injustice and hunger. 
in your bulletin today. You will see that the number of people who were starving in the world were 80 million before COVID. Now it's 260 million. The poor work, but it does not pay enough to eat. The rich have plenty of oil and wine. The fourth seal is broken, and you see a pale green horse. If this world refuses the lamb, there will be greater and greater sickness and death. What Eugene Peterson calls biological evil. We see this every day with COVID. Fifth seal. If this world refuses the lamb, there will be more and more religious persecution. The faithful followers of Jesus will be caught in the crunch between the coming of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. What is the prayer? How long, Lord? How long? Sixth seal. If the world refuses the way of the Lamb, nature itself will go more and more berserk. One natural catastrophe will follow another, leaving everyone undone. What is the prayer? Who can stand? Now, which manifestation of evil is not present today? What does that mean? It means Christ is coming. Not that he will come. He's in the process of coming. And evil is reacting more and more. So now we get to our final question. Who can stand? Chapter 7. It's those who are sealed. No damage from evil happens until God's servants are sealed on their foreheads. We heard it read in Psalm 91. No evil shall befall you. Does that mean nothing bad ever happens? No, we know that Christians suffer and die. It means no evil, no God-separating event will ever take place. You are safe in life and in death. You belong. You are marked. A seal is a sign of ownership. I own you. I recognize you. I know you as my own. John heard that the number of those who were sealed was 144,000. As one commentator says, it's a very suspiciously tidy number. It's because it's symbolic, like all the numbers in Revelation. 144. We've got a lot of math people here. You know, 12 times 12. So you've got the 12 tribes of Israel. You've got the 12 disciples who became apostles. Multiply them. The old, the new covenant. Together. People of promise. You multiply that by 10, which is the number for completeness. It's complete. You multiply that by 10. By 10. So if you have three tens, you have got a trinity of tens. This is a big number, a numberless number. John heard the number, he turned and he saw what was a multitude that could not be counted from every nation and tribe and people and language. And they were standing before the throne. This is all the people from every age who are standing before the throne of God in heaven. Who can stand when evil is riding through the earth? Those who are sealed by God. Okay, what is this seal? What is this seal on the forehead? The forehead is obvious to onlookers. It's God's name. Does it mean you're, you've got a tattoo? It means God's very character. The character of Christ is evident. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel is another one of those apocalyptic literature. 
And in chapter 9, a seal is placed on the forehead of everyone who is weary of sin and sighs over it. In Exodus 12, you have the seal, the blood of the Lamb, over the lintel of the door to show that this house is the Lord's. No death shall come. Everyone who's in this throne room is wearing a white robe. They've come through the mega flipsis, that great ordeal. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It changes their character. Obvious to onlookers. Are you sealed? Are you sealed? Do you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation? Have you received as a sign the sacrament of baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, working in you a new life so that you groan over sin and you long for the kingdom to begin in you to be expressed in the world? Ask, and you will receive. I close with this. Those who have traveled in Scotland will not be there long before you see sheep, lots of them. And if you are there long enough, you will see what may look very unusual. It will be a lamb who's running around with an extra fleece tied on its back. The fleece has holes for each of the legs and a hole for the head. It means that that little lamb's mother has died. And without the protection and nourishment from its mother, an orphaned lamb will die. If you introduce an orphaned lamb to a new mother, she will butt the lamb away because it does not smell like her own. So, in a large flock, the shepherd will generally have a ewe who has lost a lamb. And will take that lamb and take its fleece off of it and put it on the orphaned lamb and cover it and introduce it to the mother. When the mother sniffs the orphan lamb, she smells the fleece of her own lamb and accepts it as her own. The lamb who was slain is on the throne. Christ covers you with his righteousness. He seals you in the Holy Spirit. No evil shall befall you. No God-separating event will ever happen to those who are sealed in this life or the one to come. You see in Revelation 6 and 7 has the power to change your life now and for the future. I have to ask, where do you stand? Where are you standing on? What is your confidence? Let us pray. Where we ask, we may be those that stand with you and have that assurance that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus for those who have put their trust in you. So I pray this in your name. Amen. In response to God's word, I invite you you to say with me the affirmation of faith. It comes from one of our church's confessions, the Heidelberg Catechism. Question and answer one. What is your comfort, your only comfort, in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. 
He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life. It makes me wholeheartedly and will ready from now on to live for him. Let me lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, we are asking for this assurance. And we are asking that you would seal us with this conviction, this confidence, so that we may take our stand on earth against evil. That we may not condone or compromise, we may not perpetuate, we may not mirror evil, but that we may be distinctive with your character upon us. We cannot unless you give us your righteousness. And we know, Lord, that by your Spirit you are making us new. And so, our prayer is for one another. Those in this space of worship, those who will hear later, those, O oh Lord, that we represent in the wider church in the world. Our prayer is that you would make us strong and holy and followers of the Lamb. And so we do pray that you would help us in our work here at Old South and our decisions of what's ahead and discernment of your will that we may follow closely after you. We thank you for those leaders, the elders and the deacons, for our seminary intern, Jordan Greer, and for our second preacher, Tyler Lineker. We thank you for our families that support us, and we pray for them. Lord, you know the needs of our families. We ask that we may bear witness in sacrificial love, and that we might love them as you love them, and serve them and encourage them. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are recovering from surgery, as well as those who battle chronic disease. For those who bear deep grief that only you can name and know, and those who are recovering from substance abuse, we pray, O oh Lord, for those who are getting weary of the separation from pandemic, those who are afraid, who live each day in fear of the pandemic. We pray, O oh Lord, for wisdom and protection, and we pray, O oh Lord, for a release from the bondage of fear. We ask, Father, that you would help us to stay close to you and to one another, even in our separation. We ask that you would use us as civic citizens as we vote, as we speak, as we advocate, and as we get proximity with those who are in need and those, O oh Lord, who need our advocacy. We pray, Lord, that you would restore our health, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would bless our mission partners, particularly those with Wycliffe Bible Translators, Outreach Foundation, and Frank Demick. We pray these prayers and all in Jesus' name, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now give of ourselves through our offerings, through our faith, through the next steps that we take in obedience.
And so with that assurance, we can sing in the shadow of your wings. And we dedicate ourselves, we dedicate our resources, our finances, we dedicate our lives to you. And we thank you now that you will make great multiplication. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing our final song, Lord, I need you.
Rest, abide, dwell, empower you now. 